He worked at the South China Morning Post from 1993 to 2000, where he produced his own reports and wrote many feature articles on the Chinese environment. He eventually became the chief representative of SCMP.com in Beijing. He is currently an environmental consultant with Sinosphere Corporation, and he directs the Institute of Public and Environmental Affairs, which pollution the first public database of water pollution information in China. His book, Zhongguo Shui Weiji, China's Water Crisis, was published by China Environmental Sciences Publishing House in late 1999. According to Time Magazine, Majin's 1990 book, 1999 book, China's Water Crisis, may be for China what Rachel Carson's Silent Spring was for the United States, the country's first great environmental call to raising the alarm about the potentially catastrophic consequences of heedless, unsustainable growth. Was that written by Ed Norton Jr.? Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that was by uh, Ed Norton Jr., uh, the, whose father had headed the Nature Conservancy uh, in China for many years. And uh, you may know that Edward Norton Jr. is uh, an actor um, who I believe studied Chinese at Yale and spoke Chinese in the Painted Veil. Never. He didn't study Chinese. Well, he spoke. Never met him. Oh, you never met him. Oh, here he thinks you're, uh, uh, you're the Rachel Carson of China and you never, he never met you. <laughs> I liked him better in Fight Club than in uh, Painted Veil, but that's another story. We can discuss that over lunch. Uh, Ma Jun was also named as one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential Persons in the World in May of 2006. Please join me in welcoming Ma Jun, who will speak to us on Pollution Map and China's Green Choice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for your gracious introduction. And uh, I'm really happy to have this chance, I mean, happy to be invited to this, uh, to this important meeting. I think there's no perfect, no other perfect setting for this, uh, uh, for this talk about China's environment. You know, take a, then, then Berkeley, take a, take a breath and you know what the air should smell like. <laughs> Open the tap, you know what the fresh drinking water should taste like. And, uh, and I think from the previous panels, you, you, could, you, could, you learn that uh, China's facing a complex set of environmental challenges. And today, I'm going to focus on one side of it, that is pollution. China's facing a serious pollution problem. I mean, we talk about water pollution. And uh, look at this chart. You will see the category four or five and worse than category five, put together, it's about 60% of the monitored section of Chinese rivers and lakes got quite contaminated. This is official figure. And then you look at this map on, the, on your right-hand side, you will see the, this, uh, this map of uh, uh, high river basin uh, with the rivers colored according to their levels of, uh, of, of contamination. You will see that you know, black, red means, you know, contaminated, and uh, uh, black, the color of black represent rivers that is totally, you know, with water totally useless, you know. Good for no use, the quality. 60%, that is, good for no use. This is a Lake Tai in the 1980s. This is Lake Tai in May this year. In August this year, where you saw this fish people, fishermen, have been turning to, I mean, have find a new livelihood. They're paid by the local government for scooping out the algae from this vast lake. This is Lake Tai last month, still there. Lake Tai is the third largest freshwater lake in China. Lake Chao, again, this is I think July or when I was there, suffered from eutrophication, bad algae bloom. Lake Dianchi in Yunnan province, similar attack this year. So these three events really, you know, shocked the Chinese people and, uh, and has hopefully weakened up many of them. Pollution of I mean, increasingly, the pollution getting into the coastal seas, 
300, no, um, 317 billion tons, no, 30, sorry, 31 billion tons got discharged into our coastal seas. And you can see on the right-hand side, you will see 80% of the discharge points cannot meet the discharge standards. As a result, all this purple color means the seawater is good for new use. Air pollution, equally bad. Uh, uh, respiratory particulates are the main pollutants for many parts. And sulfur dioxide, very bad. Sand and dust, as we have found, you know, the, during the previous panel, that it's also very bad. So result of all this discharge of uh, sulfur dioxide and, uh, and anox acid rain have become a big problem in this. I mean, drained one third of the, of the country, especially in the southern part. And um, uh, this partic particulates are big problems in the northern part of China. Now, increasingly, we, we started getting weather forecasts. You know, in, in our weather forecast, we started getting forecasts for haze. Not before, but in recent years, you know, we're starting getting that. And haze means fine dust that, that will reduce the visibility to less than 10 kilometers. Um, and, uh, and you can see it's, uh, it's just uh, really handing over a large period, uh, area in northern part of China. And all this pollution has multiple impacts on our society. It, obviously, it has an impact on biodiversity, on the ecosystem. When the river is running out of water, all, all the water turned black. No fish can survive, eco-fish or crowfish. And then it has an impact on the public health. Still need to be studied, but we do know that um, you know, when 320 million rural residents don't have access to safe drinking water, that will have an impact on their health. And it has an impact on the sustainable use of our resources, like water, fresh water. Too much got polluted. Fresh water, uh, clean water got polluted by, by this dirty water. And then you have, you know, the impact on, on social stability. All these collective incidents, riots caused by pollution. So based on the, all this, you know, this, this is, the, the reason behind that is the increased discharge that damage our environment. Water, wastewater discharge have gone up, instant, I mean, steadily gone up, and emission have gone way beyond environmental capacity in recent years. And based on all this very, I think, pragmatical concerns over social political reasons, our new leadership have changed it, their mindset. You know, when I wrote the book, China's Water Crisis, it's basically targeting this idea that uh, we should develop at whatever cost. But things have changed very fast. In recent years, our government is talking new strategy, like, you know, building a harmonious society with the harmony between man and nature, a main theme of it, and turn to scientific outlook of development basically means more sustainable and managed and, and, and balanced development. And just in the, in, in the party Congress, just that, that has been convened earlier this year, President Hu used this term, ecological uh, civilization, just to bring it to a new height. And all the ministries are kind of vowed to change the ways of economic development. I mean, the State Council have laid out this 11th five-year plan, which they set target on conservation, energy conservation, and pollution reduction. But we got to keep in mind it won't happen naturally. Pollution control targets have never been met during the past 20 years. And the 11th five-year plan already, I mean, has been missed in the year 2006. So again, you know, we're seeing the government is making huge efforts, enforcement campaigns like this and this, and this, and this, you know, all these things are going on to try to enforce, try to shut down the 
polluted factories. But we also need to keep in mind all the three freshwater lakes we have just seen, tens of billions have been spent uh, during the past uh, 10 years and to, to try to restore them. You know, the very, very heavy-handed crackdown have been done. So we have to draw lessons from that. I mean, what, what happened, went wrong? You know, what, what stopped us from, from, from dealing with our pollution problem? I think that when we look, at the, look, into, you know, look deeper into that, uh, we could see that the weak enforcement is a, is a real problem. You know, we copy the laws and regulations from standards from Western countries, but they're not enforced properly. Like a factory, uh, uh, a factory in Shanxi like this, you know, should be dealt with. But on this wall, uh, there's a sign saying that it's a key protected enterprises. Um, and this is not rare. You often see, you know, signs like this in many parts of China, sometimes hand on the front door saying that, you know, like this one saying, without permission, no unit should come to check or chart. So sometimes you will read local regulations saying that this, this industrial zone is free, you know, from all this bothering, and um, every year there should be one no more than one monitoring of the, uh, of the affluent and uh, uh, just one time a year. And that's a way to, to attract all the investors, including foreign investors. This is the largest tributary of the Yellow River. When we sit, when we stood there, it's kind of really polluted. 800 million, 800 million tons got discharged into this but you have factories like this, you know, a joint venture between Kalsberg, you know, a subsidiary of Kalsberg in the upper reach of, the, of this river, uh, operating for two years without any treatment facilities, discharged directly into the drinking water source of the local city. And the reason behind that, when CCTV went there, interviewed a, the local EPB chief, you know, he, he said that uh, we have done our job. Every year we sent two letters to them, you know, imposing <laughs> fines twice on this factory, each time 5,000 yuan. <laughs> but to build a sewage plant, it will cost them 3.9 million. So the guy said, basically, you know, 390 years, they could use the money to pay, to pay the fine. So they choose to do that. So the cost of violation is way too low. But of course, behind that, it's not just, uh, you know, we're silly that we impose such a low fine on them. It's behind that, it's the protectionism. Some local government officials want to give to this, to this polluters, since they are major taxpayers. And just uh, not far from that uh, site of very of terrible way river pollution, and we have seen a state-of-the-art new sewage plant, you know, kind of financed with, uh, uh, by, by the Danish government, you know, when they, with Danish equipment. Uh, but for a year, nothing happened. It's just a, a rot under the sun. So huge infrastructure, you know, huge spending on, on infrastructure. We're talking about 200 billion yuan to be spent on sewage plant. But but we also found, you know, quite a substantial proportion of them don't function properly. So all this means one thing. I think that we need to, we need to engage broader stakeholder groups in our management. If we want to control pollution, we have to strengthen our enforcement of laws. But if you want to strengthen enforcement, you, you want to break these ties, you know, between the money and the, and the power. And to break that, you need to engage more stakeholder groups to, you know, you need public participation. And to encourage public participation, I think the precondition, you've got to have access to information. If people don't know what is happening, they cannot meaningfully participate in this. 
So some people ask questions about the money, about the uh, technology. I think at this moment, the first step, I mean, it's not just, it's not a matter of technology. And it's not even primarily a matter of money. We spent billions of yuan on that. I think the, the most important thing we need to fix our, you know, we need to make some institutional change. And on that, China has progressed. Got to give credit to the government. You know, since 2003, China has come up with, uh, created all these policies and laws to support a different way of, different type of governance. Environmental impact assessment law is the first law in our history, I think in thousands of years, at least in, in, in new China, that requires public participation in any public uh, decision-making process. And this is the environmental law. And since then, you know, the State Council have laid out its new policy and, uh, and then they, they even make laws to require corporates to disclose their, their data to the public. We have the Cleaner Production Promotion Law, which said that uh, they got to disclose that. And this got repeated by a new law, you know, called Access to Environmental Information Measures. It's basically a Freedom of Information Act type of law, which requires any polluters found, you know, for violating the standards, disclose their discharge data within one month on local media. This will go into effect next May. So based on all this legal and policy basis, uh, we have decided that uh, if we want to tackle pollution problem, we need to create a database to give people first, give people access to information, to data. So we, last September, we launched the China Water Pollution Map, which give data on wastewater, you know, on, waste, uh, on water quality, on um, wastewater discharge, and also a list of violators on the national level, on the provincial level, and on the municipality level, basically 300 municipalities. So the, the advantage of, uh, of a database is that you can rank and have a comparative cross view of the discharge. For example, I mean, this is on the, on the water map. You could see, you know, which province uh, discharge more kind of toxics Water, water toxics. This is on land. Uh, you can see Hunan is on top of that. Arsenic, again, it's this province. Chromium, uh, hexavalent chromium, Hunan on top, three times more than the second. And cadmium, again, it's this city, this province. Mercury, the same. And Cyanide, the same. So, I mean, only when you put them in, the, in, in this way, you know, when you cross compare, I think it, it will arouse the public attention that uh, uh, there might be some hidden problems. Uh, it's not like the Taihu Lake, you know, it, people can, can smell that, can, can taste that, but this is toxics, you know, you, you, you cannot, without, monitor, without testing, costly testing, you cannot find that. But, we do have the government data on this, and, um, and by, by, by putting that up, uh, I'm glad to see that some of the papers have already, you know, went there to do their investigative research. Uh, some magazines are falling up. I think this question, this problem is getting more attention at this moment. And increasingly, this list of non-compliant com companies have got more attention because this is very tied to the solution. I mean, who are legally responsible for this terrible water pollution? So we created this list of non-compliant companies and now it has been expanded to 9,487. Basically 9,400 records of violations. And we also work with uh, local NGOs you mean using this government source data to, and then we go on the ground to pinpoint this, you know, try to position all this, uh, all these polluters to, to, 
give people a better idea of where they are, you know, uh, which community are they located. And you can see that uh, we have a polluters map and uh, which can help you to see, you know, this is the, the blue line is the Yellow River, uh, the, the section from Gansu to Ningxia. And you can see how close all these polluters are located uh, beside the river because they need a lot of water and they use our river as, 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 as a discharge point, as a sewer, open sewer. And when you get a closer look, you could, you could click on one of them and then you will see according to which government document this factory have violated what standards in which year. And this is a SIPA, SIPA document saying that uh, this factory, the Gansu Lanzhou uh, New, New West Vinilong Company, uh, located uh, 20 kilometers upper stream of the local drinking water source, 30 meters away from the Yellow River without any emergency response facilities, and uh, uh, more than 10, 000, nearly 10,000 tons of wastewater. Uh, not sure where, uh, how they discharge that. They're basically not sure. And then you will probably get a better idea who are responsible for turning our rivers so colorful. You know, this uh, yellow river, you can see this uh, color, uh, the, the quality have been, you know, colored according to their level of, of damage. And then we have moved to, expanded to air pollution uh, earlier this year, you know, sponsored by WWF Hong Kong and uh, ADM Foundation in Hong Kong. So we work together to develop this. And uh, uh, this is supposed to give people a better idea about the air quality. Uh, again, people can rank that and see, you know, sulfur dioxide, uh, the ranking in their city, you know, the concentration level of sulfur dioxide. And um, nitrogen oxide, dioxide, you will see again a list of rankings and uh, uh, PM10, uh, average dust fall and uh, rain pH, you get the acid rain frequency. And again, you have this list of non-compliant companies, 4,000 of them, um, who, who violated the, 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 the air emission standards across the country. So the criteria for list all these companies is violations of national or regional standards. And most companies listed for violations of water, air emission standards. Uh, majority broke the concentration standards. Uh, total volume is still you know, not enforced properly. A few uncertain what specific standards they violated because the government simply say they break the law. And then some listed for violation of procedure requirements such as EIA requirements. But we do have a keynote here. What listed are records of violations that may not re reflect the current status. Source of info all come from the government source. Um, so we take them from the annual report. We take them from the, uh, all these websites of government, the news media, who, which quoted government documents. And we compiled a various agencies list. For example, the, the, the list that requires these companies to, uh, companies are, which are required to deal with their pollution problem within a deadline, or sometimes they're, uh, they're blacklisted for, uh, uh, for, for pollution. So we just put them together, beats and beats. And we also developed an environmental transparency index to gauge the disclosure level of various government agencies, mainly the environmental agencies. And um, you can see some of the regions like Shanghai are more open, but regions like Guangdong, a really export-oriented industry center that sells so much to this country. I mean, they don't give much about all this, all their polluters. And um, in one document, I see that they say, oh, we have 12, hundred bad, badly polluted factories in, in our city, but they don't give a single name of that. And, um, and, and, and in this transparency index, we do have one, more than 100 cities 
that scores zero, basically they, just, they give no data, no meaningful data about their wastewater situation. And this become headline news on some of the local papers. So what happened in our country is, you know, why it's so bad? Because, you know, industrialization, urbanization, and globalization come together in, in some 20 years of time. And uh, uh, this put tremendous pressure on our environment. Uh, and the industrialization is an is a energy and resource intensive one. And the urbanization is not very based on sustainable model. And this globalization, China has exported so much. It's become a factory of the world. And uh, much of the manufacturing process have been transferred to our country. You know, sometimes I, when I fly you know, across this continent, I, I keep thinking about, you know, everywhere looks greener and uh, cleaner. And, and I just feel that uh, it, it, it seems like the whole rest of the world become residential area on the earth. Well, we have been turned into a, a production zone. So we better manage that production zone properly. And uh, I think people in our country need to take their responsibility. You know, we need to be more aware of this. So based on this thinking, you know, people need to take action. And we launched a so-called Green Choice Initiative along with 20 other NGOs in China in March this year. Basically calling on, upon our people to, to reflect upon the, the, the environmental behavior of all this part of all these companies. You know, make them thinking about some of the products, quality may be fine, but their manufacturing process is polluting and uh, they're damaging the quality of life, sometimes threatening the life of people. So now we have plenty of choices, th thanks to the fact that China has been turned into a market economy. You know, people have plenty of choices and there's a growing middle class. You know, why should we choose those products if we know who are damaging our environment during the process. And, uh, and, and the other side of this Green Choice Initiative is on the supply chain. I think this go back to the, I mean, it's something that I really want to cross the message here that you know, Western consumers may also help us in a great way if they can help to green the supply chain in our country. The big box retailers and large scale industry they have suppliers on our list. And, uh, and we call upon them to strengthen their supply chain management. We hope that one day they could openly announce that we won't use polluters as our suppliers in China. This is gonna be a huge support to China's pollution control. Probably the single biggest you know, effective way to do it. Um, and the case study, let me give you one case. This Dongguan Fuan textile owned by a Hong Kong listed company is a major supplier to Walmart and Nike and others. But it's ended up one of the worst water polluters in our country. It built a thick secret pipe underneath the factory floor and dumped roughly 22,000 tons of wastewater a day without treatment into the nearby river. So all these companies, you know, all these big names, Gap, Target, you know, when they got interviewed by Wall Street Journal, they basically say that uh, it's difficult to monitor this. Nike is the only one who come up, came up with some evidence that they monitor the performance of this factory, environmental performance. And basically, it said that uh, we, we want them to send the sampled water to a to designated laboratory every year, you know, to to monitor that. But of course, the company, the, the supplier, did its own sampling <laughs> with someone who, who built a secret pipe, you know, discharged 22,000 tons a day. That's, that's quite strange, and I should say that. Um, but interestingly, you know, on our, on our database, if you look at that, if you type in the name of this factory, the key word of it is good enough, you will come up with a result and, uh, and you click check and you will find 
the end of 2004, December 2004, this company had been found violating the discharge standards by local government. So this tool probably is useful to some of the big, big companies. And I think with this tool, you know, it got to be no more excuse. There shouldn't be any excuse for saying that China is a mystery, you know, we don't know what is going on. No, we do have nearly 14,000 records there, and I really challenge them to use that. And I think they wouldn't do it very easily because it matters to their bottom line. Uh, probably matters to this always low price strategy. So I think the consumers need to give them some push here. Of course, we don't, you know, all these companies are so important. You know, business is important to our country. China has been tremendously benefited through globalization. But in the meantime, I don't think they have the rights to neglect their environmental duty, uh, to externalize their costs on others. So they, the companies need to come up with some solutions. I mean, we help them with that too. But we don't want to destroy anyone. I mean, we, 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 we have created this path towards solution. I mean, the company could send us a feedback. They could send us following up agency monitoring data. We're happy to run that to give them a fair treatment. But most importantly, they need to provide us result of third-party audit if they want to remove their records from that. So it's how to regain public trust. They could commitment, make commitment to correction and third-party audit, and then they follow the audit protocol, audit both their management system and also their hardware facilities to ensure they have the capacity, and then this process got to be supervised by local environmental groups to make sure it's a credible one. And then the third party audit results should be published. So far, it caused some chain reactions. You know, 50 companies have come to explain what went wrong and, uh, and the corrective action they took. I mean, th this is a result not just, you know, we are a pe institute of four people. So it's not, this are global 500 companies, many of them. So it's not just, it's not just our pressure, it's very limited. But it's caused some chain reaction, like the embassies. You know, the Japanese embassy sent letters to all the Japanese companies, 50, 60, 60 of them on our list, and to say that you better explain, you know, better fix the problem. And uh, their client companies, some of them are big suppliers to other companies and uh, who are more careful, cautious about their brand name. So they told them to, to change. And some banks, some, some companies coming to us saying that their bank cut their loans. We've never talked with any banks, but obviously they're using that. Trade unions, it's not, it should be industrial associations. Some say that, uh, you know, you are Hai Chun Zhima, you better fix your problem. And competitors, competitors also report, you know, others for saying that my neighbor is even worse and <laughs> I'm happy to run that as well and uh, uh, to, to make it fair. How to regain this trust? I think seven companies finally have, you know, so far have committed a third party audit and two, two have passed that, have the records removed. The others are still making corrective actions. And uh, it has incentivized some good practices. Some have established the internal monitoring system. They have built up their own database to track the, all the discharge of their, their own plants. Before, you know, these companies coming to us often say that, you know, this is wrong. We haven't done anything wrong. But then 10 days later, they come back and say that, look, we, we're not reported. You know, we failed to get the report from our local factory who just choose to pay the fine, but not really report that. And some have decided to audit all the other plants, not just the one who have been found violating the standards. And some have recycled water, you may use this low cost way of, uh, uh, of, of pollution control. You know, they, they have better recycling rate. And some have, uh, have decided to do pre-closure environmental audit to all their factories. Um, so I would like to close this by saying, you know, the, 
what we want to do is to create a new dynamic between the government, private sector, and the public. Uh, I think the public needs information and the channels to participate. And NGOs, you know, they need to compile government source the data and present it to the public with a big, big help from the mass media. There's no, you know, it, it, it cannot be overstated. You know, the media is so important here. We got so much help from them. Government agencies, they need allies. I mean, some of them want to do it right, but they need allies. They're weak in for, they're weak department. So they reacted to this by strengthening enforcement, and some of the polluters got suspended, like the one, the Kosberg, uh, Kosberg uh, uh, subsidiary I mentioned, you know, have been suspended and required by local government for building a wastewater treatment facilities. And corporations think they need the incentives. Sometimes they, you know, they came to us uh, at the beginning are very offensive, defensive, but at the end, always show their human face. You know, I cared about this. My children live here as well. And, but it's hard to make the decision in the boardroom, in the boardroom, if, you know, to spend a decent amount of money in China because you know, the risk is low. We make good money, and uh, why should we care? And so I think they reacted by taking their own environmental responsibility. Basic, you know, basically want to create some accountability here. Uh, so I stop here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Majun, for a really terrific presentation that has helped to link together many of the themes that we discussed over the last two days and strongly emphasizing that the internal is external and that the external is internal and that we, uh, the focus here has been on environmental issues in China, but that these are global issues and that we in the Bay Area, we in California also have a, a, a major role to play in helping uh, working with the Chinese to address these issues. Because as said before, if the dust storms, if the acid rain blow from China over here, it's a, it's a question that involves uh, all of us. I hope you will leave us with the website so that we can, this is a website, right? Yes. So make sure you tell us what the website is so that we can access it. One thing before I open it up, uh, two questions from the floor that I wanted to, uh, I wanted to uh, stress and, and ask you about is certainly the courage that you display uh, in the sort of work that you're doing in China. And you, you showed us the pictures of Lake Tai, of Taihu. And many of us in the room are aware of the case of Wulihong, who is an environmental activist in China who exposed exactly the sort of problems with Lake Tai that you have discussed and has nonetheless been sentenced to a three-year term in jail and is in jail uh, on char Trump, apparently trumped up charges of forgery or fraud or some, some, some sort of uh, clear, clear pretext uh, such, as, such as that. And how, this is the courage that is involved in doing this sort of thing. So in some cases, the local governments are providing the data. They're providing the data, they're admitting mistakes, they're letting you go in there with one hand, and the other hand, they're putting other activists in jail and refusing to admit, to apologize to him and to admit that he was right. Uh, so I wonder if you would comment, you, the role of NGOs is still such a fragile, uh, it's still in such a fragile position in China. I wonder if you would open up by talking about that uh, a little bit more and then I'll start, uh, uh, be, we've built in some extra time, we don't start in the afternoon until 2.45. Uh, after, and you're all invited to lunch so that we will have um, some time to engage with uh, Majin now before we adjourn for lunch. So if you want to, if you could respond to that. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we're talking about public participation and obviously, you know, China is uh, uh, somewhat different from this country. And uh, uh, we, for thousands of years, thousands of years, we don't have a history of participation and uh, uh, no tradition no institutional mechanism. Uh, it's, uh, it's just, uh, we just see the emergence, emerging trend of that. 
Uh, and I think the society uh, needs some time to adapt to this, um, obviously. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think, you know, it takes, it, it takes time and uh, sometimes uh, it takes uh, a strategy because, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the society is not uh, as prepared um, and uh, and obviously, you know, uh, what we support is is the uh, we we do support this one idea uh, worked out by the by the government. This idea of orderly participation. I think we uh, we want to we we want to see more participation, and the government realized that single-handedly it uh, it cannot solve the problem. They want more participation, but in the meantime, uh, you know, neither the government nor us want to say chaos. And, and I think the, the idea of orderly participation could be some sort of consensus point. Um, but but it, I mean, someone called for patience. I think, you know, we, if the direction is moving towards something different, uh, a more open, transparent, and participatory, uh, uh, a rule of law, this new, you know, good governance, then I think we all should have some patience. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, there, are, there are a lot of hands, so I would, and I want to try to get everybody a chance to speak. Please, no speeches and be brief. Stanley? And, yeah, wait for the mic. Thank you. I know that's what you're doing. I want your model, a model citizen, model public participant. Thank you. My name is Stanley <laughs> Lubman, and I've been specializing on Chinese law for many years. And I congratulate you on your courage, your thoughtfulness, and your, art, and your uh, imagination. Uh, I want to touch on one point, because you have, in your talk, touched on a theme that, ha that I see running through many of the talks that we've had so far in this conference. That is the need to strengthen the rule of law. And I would like to, uh, I'd like to know uh, how, whether you see any prospect, well, I, I see the need to come from the top, that, that the leadership has to muster the political will to bring about genuine improvements in the rule of law. That is, to strengthen enforcement, as you say, and to increase the cost uh, of violation. And I wonder, given what you've just said about not wanting to have chaos and the problems in Chinese society, whether you see the prospects for any stronger push by the leadership to muster the political will to promote a, a strengthening of the rule of law in the near future. Thank you. Uh, I think we have, as I mentioned, that our top leadership is now, you know, for pragmatical uh, reasons, quite determined to solve our environmental problems. So there are a lot of you know, growing consensus in our society. There's, there, there, there are quite big uh, political will uh, on the central government level, uh, but to translate that into uh, effective solution, you know, action, uh, I think it's uh, it, it it's very difficult because the uh, the whole thing got you know we got knee deep into this uh, this current uh, uh, growth model, which is you know, based very energy and uh, polluting intent, uh, energy intensive. And also, you know, uh, I think institutionally, we have a lot of problem there. Uh, one thing, you know, I, I, I was often told that 80% of the pollution problems are solved in this country at court. You know, you basically have the court to solve the problem. But in our country, it's, uh, um, you know, to be honest, it's still quite difficult to, 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 to have the court to solve this environmental problems. Uh, we, we learned yesterday, uh, you know, from Barbara, uh, I very much agree with her. You know, it's, it's actually getting more difficult to try to solve the problem at the court. Uh, when, you, when you restrict, put high, you know, very strict restriction on class action lawsuits, and think about that, class action lawsuit for the water pollution, for example, they often affect uh, uh, many people but you want them to go to the court one by one, and it's just uh, quite impossible to do, you know, with those disadvantaged groups. So rule of law, it will take time. I think that, uh, you know, it's uh, sort of, we could push for that, but 
But to have an independent judicial system, it's going to take some time, I think. Uh, and, and China's environmental problem, as I mentioned, it's quite urgent. So when we push for that, we also need to take other actions. And, uh, uh, and sometimes I, I, I keep thinking, you know, we, we shouldn't be too dependent on the court or on the, on the agencies, which is obviously still not quite, you know, responsible. Uh, but we could use the government source data and put pressure directly on the, on the corporations who claim that they want to be responsible corporate citizens and they breach their vows and now it's time to, to, to set up some, put some pressure on them. Uh, if they want to change, I don't see there's opportunities for the government to say that uh, don't, don't change. I mean, don't keep polluting. I, 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 don't, I don't see that. So I find that there, there are pressure points that probably we should touch. Thank you. You'll be, you'll be next, and then uh, one more. Thank you very much. Um, I want to try to tie two things together. Um, Jan Hamron yesterday spoke very eloquently about uh, the personal impact of these issues on families, on children, and so on. Um, so I'm curious, and since we've had a panel about health issues, um, if you could if there is good data about the impact of the water and air pollution on the food chain and what that's doing to the health situation in China. Because that's so personal and so direct that, yes. that it gives you another pressure point. Is there that kind of effort going on in China? Thank you. Uh, definitely. I think health, uh, public health is uh, such an important issue and uh, there's no better way to mobilize the citizens uh, than, you know, telling them the truth about the health impact. The health impact got to be really big and the, um, all this haze, all this uh, particulate we mentioned, you know, it has health impact uh, on hundred thousand of people, you know, as urban citizens, uh, Basically, you know, about a third of our urban residents have been exposed to badly polluted air and uh, mentioned about 320 million rural residents who don't have access to safe drinking water and food. Food, you know, we have a large crop of land, cropland, large piece of cropland still irrigated with, with water and um, uh, as a result, 12 million tons of grain got contaminated by heavy metals every year. These are all official data. So I think, you know, this is big. Uh, so far, not, we still need to do more research into this uh, and uh, uh, to, to get the data right. And in the meantime, you know, I, I think uh, there's some legitimacy in this concern over the social disturbance, you know, when you how about this, all this food, you know, you don't, if you don't eat that, I mean, what, what do you eat? <laughs> and uh, uh, this, is a, this is a very practical issue. Uh, so I, th I think at least we should, move in, we should move toward that direction. You know, at least uh, we should see each year we expand the disclosure of the health impact to our people. You know, not one off, not, not, not all at one, you know, oh, not, not, not overnight, but probably gradually. We need to let people know more about this. Uh, and I'm glad to see, you know, various agencies are doing their, their, their research into the contamination of uh, our groundwater, the aquifer. N no solid research before, and now there's a huge 10-year project going on. And we have seen that uh, all this SEPA is checking tens of thousands of chemical factories to have them register, you know, about all the toxics they use. I think all these are important. Thank you. Yeah, I have a, qu a question about how consumers would access this information. Is your database bilingual? And also, are there any American associations where all these manufacturers, like there's certified organic, where you, consumers can find out um, what is the status of the company that they're buying environmentally? I appreciate this question. And uh, uh, so far, the air pollution database, which will be launched uh, next week, 
Uh, it hasn't been launched yet. Uh, it will be bilingual, but just a, a part of that will, I mean, you can maneuver through that, but all this contents have not really been translated. I mean, partially due to the constraint of our resources, but, but more because you know, we also worried about this uh, uh, legal liability issue, you know, when you translate the name of, of a company, I'm not quite sure, you know, on the, on the Chinese side, it's all copy and paste work, uh, it's pretty safe. It's all come from government source, a government document, but when you translate that, you know, all this English name of the companies, I, 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 I'm still figuring out, you know, how to deal with that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, but this, yeah, it will be a hurdle to the consumers on this side, but it's not, shouldn't be a hurdle to those obstacle to the, to, to the big, big companies. They all have their resources. They all have their, their team on, in China. They, they, they shouldn't say that, uh, you know, because we don't read Chinese, so we don't. They, they can spend half a day to go through, compare their list of suppliers with all this list of violators. I think there's no excuse for them. And uh, to make it more user friendly, we are trying to uh, categorize you know, all these polluters according to their industries. So we're redesigning our, our, our database. And in the meantime, you know, this access to environmental information measures will be effective next May. Uh, at that time, you know, what we try to do is to, 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 to go along with, uh, with all these grassroots groups, including those groups uh, supported by Pacific Environment and others, uh, to uh, whenever they, they learn about and they, they, they access a new list of violators, they should go to require for their discharge data. And we're gonna redesign our backend to try to input those data disclosed and, uh, and eventually be able to rank them, uh, rank according to their you know, then we could have a better idea who are the really bad polluters and who should get the, 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 the biggest pressure. Thank you. I, I was going to see if Isabel wanted to respond. I don't know if you heard Isabel Hilton's presentation yesterday about China Dialogue, um, if, if, you if you have that sort of bilingual information. Well, we don't. Um, uh, as Majun knows, his database is voluminous, and we don't have all of that information, but we're working on on being a channel for uh, Western consumers to access exactly this information so that, that all the supply chain issues uh, will be transparent to people, and that will be on China Dialogue. We're, we're, we're talking about how to do that right now, so watch this space and keep checking China Dialogue, and you can read more about Ma Jun and the database on China Dialogue, so, um, and, and indeed he's a columnist for us, so hey, yeah. <laughs> if you want to know more, that's where to go. So uh, yeah, we're, we're working together on this because we think it's a very important uh, transnational um, issue, and we can bring, we can help to bring more pressure on, on these companies who go to China and behave badly, you know, uh, manufacturing for the China price. So it's an example of co constructive cooperation. Thank you. Uh, one, run had, uh, one run had a question here. Well, I would, I would re really like to uh, join others to congratulate you for the wonderful job you've been doing. And this is absolutely important. So my questions are related to two questions, related to how to make it better, how to enforce it. Uh, one is precisely, I would like to know, uh, how do you interact with relevant Chinese government agencies such as SIPA or N uh, NDRC? Do they listen to you? Do you get support from them? What is exactly the role that, because it's absolutely in the direction of the Chinese government now, and I think Hu Jintao should invite you to the Politburo study session to have this presentation. But before that, I would like to see what the working relationship you have at the moment with the key agencies, because it's very important for local enterprises when they have a seal of the government approval. Number two, questions going abroad, that is, uh, Isabel mentioned the linkage. How, do you have uh, four people, absolutely amazing, you do the job. Do you have a mechanism for your organization uh, to tell the rest of us here, many NGOs, foundations, institutions, do you have a mechan mechanism that's set up for these people to link up with you? 
uh, for example, to pressure some of these multinational corporations, which should know better and do better in China, to reinforce your message and force them to comply. Thank you. Thank you very much for the two good questions. And uh, uh, on the first question, we have a, a, a relatively OK relationship with our government agencies, especially on the central government level. Uh, uh, you're right, you know, the, the, the trend is moving toward that. So uh, we're just, uh, you know, this is just shun shui tui zhou. You know, you just, you just follow the trend. And, um, uh, uh, and, 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 and sometimes, you know, the, we, we do have them coming to us saying that, uh, uh, could you give us some, you know, some source of your data? And it's actually all coming from them, but the different agencies, because we put data from different agencies, compile them together, and sometimes they want to uh, more comprehensive data or special categorization. We, we, we do provide those. Uh, on the local government level, uh, it's slightly more complicated. You know, uh, sometimes we do have, uh, on the provincial level, you know, some people say that, you know, we, this is what we want because it's, uh, uh, the cost of violations is so low, you know, the, the, the polluters don't usually pay enough respect to us and to, to, our, to our enforcement campaign. But, uh, but by doing this, you know, you, 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 you substantially raise the cost of violation by putting a pressure on their reputation. So, so they want to see this, uh, but we do have some fairly local agencies coming to us. You know, sometimes in very difficult situation, they're going to say that, uh, you know, look, you, you list this company based on our records, and now I say that's a good company. Why can't you remove that from the list? That put us in a quite awkward situation, and uh, but luckily we do have a a space to rec record whatever statement that the local government agency want to say. So I say that I put there. If people trust that, then the companies have no more problem if uh, if that's good enough. So eventually that company, you know, there's one case. In one case, that company. You know, the local government say, oh, this is a company with 6,000 employees and a uh, major contributor to our, uh, to our tax, and, uh, and, and, and you better remove that. And, uh, and, but eventually, the company bowed to the pressure and uh, decided to, I mean, pressure, potential pressure from their client company, and decided to go through a third-party audit. Uh, so that's something you know, going on. And as I mentioned, sometimes, you know, we do have a case, uh, some cases where the local activists reported to us about uh, re violations. Uh, what we do is we cannot directly, you know, we cannot just record this company into our database based on that reporting. Uh, instead, we do intensive research back home to try to get, find whatever government source data on this company. And uh, uh, amazingly, quite, quite a few times we found those records, you know, sometimes after several months. But when we found that, we highlight that. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, our media pick it up and went there, put things on camera. Uh, in two cases, you know, in, uh, within just, within weeks, the local government announced that this company had been repeatedly violating the standards. And we have told them to fix, they failed, and now we shut it down. And, uh, and order them to, to build uh, wastewater facilities. So you can see this is a, a whole cycle that is started from the people, you know, from the communities. And then to us, you know, as an NGO, we get government sourced the data. The government have probably, I mean, obviously have done its job because it has some level of disclosure. We get that, sometimes just one quote, uh, but that's good enough for violating the standards. And then we put that there and uh, media ex reported that, and then this pressure goes back to the government to order that company to change, and then the company under this pressure gets some incentive to really fix their problem. So there's a whole cycle here. I think this is probably, you know, two records have been removed, but we still have 9,000 there. Uh, on the water side. So we still need to do a lot like this. We need to create more pressure. So that's why we need your help. And your second question is about uh, the, uh, the supply. 
Oh, that's right, yeah. External NGO, we have some NGOs coming to us expressing, uh, express their interest to work together. I really appreciate that. At this, at this moment, we have some talk with, uh, with some groups uh, uh, in Hong Kong, in America. Uh, in the, I mean, again, this is a fine, delicate game to play because I, I don't want this to be a China bashing tool. Uh, you know, made in China products already face a lot of pressure in, in this part of the world. And I think it's totally wrong for us to try to stop this globalized trading because, you know, we, we all got benefits through that. But in the meantime, you know, if we don't manage that properly, if we allow this flawed system to continue, then we both suffer. Uh, I think we don't want to throw the baby with the bathwater. We want to find the solutions. We, now we come up with some easy tools to use. Uh, I think that's a starting point. Uh, that's a way to, to identify, the, 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 to differentiate the good ones, the, the, the responsible ones from the bad ones, and that is a way to go. It's not like, you know, I, I don't think what happened on, the cap, on your Capitol Hill is, is all correct. You know, it's all this this bashing, this, made in China, this panic about made in China product, I think it's wrong. Uh, we gotta find, there are solutions. We gotta create incentives to make that work. Um, in the red sweater. Yeah, you showed us a list with uh, 9,000 some polluters, but you also showed us uh, some signs outside some uh, factories saying you, basically you can't inspect us. Does this mean we are looking only at the tip of the iceberg? Yeah, <laughs> good question, and that's, that's probably true because uh, we do learn, uh, there's one do document say that uh, in one year, uh, more than 20,000 factories have violated our standards, uh, and, and, and in that year, we only got 3,000 in our database. So obviously, there are a lot of gaps there. As I mentioned, you know, in some provinces, with tens of thousands of of export-oriented industries, they don't really give a lot of data. But things may change. As I mentioned, you know, this, this SEPA uh, measures, you know, the measures on the uh, inform environmental information disclosure, you know, uh, directly uh, under the, you know, the, it's a kind of a direct re re result of, uh, of Pan Yue, you know, the Vice Minister's efforts uh, will be, quite, I, I really think that that will be quite influential uh, because, I mean, it's different from the past law. Um, it, it basically say, you know, those who failed are gonna be charged, a, a fined 100,000 yuan. That may not sound much, but it followed by saying that the local government's agency will be responsible to disclose their discharge data. Uh, it also have requirements for the government to dis disclose 17 different types of, of, of information, you know, the, basically supporting documents for their decision making. So I think all the stakeholders should work together to make sure this law got enforced, not like the, 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 the policy and the law before. Ellen? This will have to be the last, the last question. Uh, back here. Ellen Spitalnik, I'm a visiting scholar here at Berkeley, but I spent about 20 years as an enforcement lawyer at US Environmental Protection Agency and subsequently for some other federal agencies. So I commend you for this incredible effort, which sounds like a lot of the things that we used to do as enforcement lawyers at EPA, questions like the environmental audit and the corrective action uh, so um, my question for you uh, is, is a couple of things. Uh, first, can you tell us a little more about the two that got off the list and who did the audits and who made the decisions about the corrective actions? And second, I wanted to share one public participation uh, uh, regulation here. Uh, the, Depart the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, when they work with EPA and we arrive at a decision, hey, you guys decided you want to do the right thing, devil's in the details, we arrange what's called the consent decree. And then there's a 30-day public comment period where that consent decree is, is put in our federal register, 
and folks can comment. So since this appears to be a situation where the NGO community is filling a space that perhaps the government has, has not in the enforcement sector, how does public participation work uh, as well in, in this situation? What's your first question? I'm sorry. I, oh. <laughs> pro sorry. Probably it should be lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. The two cases. Oh, the two cases. Yeah, That's two right. cases. And who did the environmental audit on that? And what, yeah. who made the decision on corrective uh, two, action? Two cases. I mean, the first one is uh, Panasonic Battery, um, based in Shanghai. And they, got a, they, they, they were audited by the, you know, they, they, they make two renovations of their wastewater facilities. And eventually, they've been audited by the uh, Shanghai uh, Environmental Science Research Institute. And, um, uh, and we, along with a, sh a local uh, NGO called uh, uh, Green Oasis, uh, participated in this process. And eventually, we accepted the, the, uh, the conclusion made drawn by the Shanghai Environmental Science Research Institute that this company have the management system and, uh, and, and facility to, to ensure uh, uh, steady compliance. So that got removed after that. It became the number one. The number two is called Shanghai Shenmei Beverage Company. And uh, this one uh, was re uh, audited, you know, by Shanghai, uh, no, by a URS, you know, this URS corporation, it's a, uh, it's a global uh, environmental consulting firm. And uh, this company, uh, quite unusually, you know, they reported this violation to us by itself. Um, we haven't found that. Uh, so they reported, they say that we also have a problem. And uh, uh, so eventually, you know, it found that they have built a, an extra facility since that violation and now have the capacity to deal with the problem. So their records got removed after that. And uh, your second, to your second question, I think, you know, China is slightly different um, when you have uh, uh, thousands of employees in that Ronald Reagan building. Uh, you know, the EPA have a lot of staffs. Well, we have about 240 something, you know, in our SIPA to take charge of this whole big land mass. So much going on every day. And uh, the joke is that the memorial hall of the, of the late Chairman Mao has a staff of 300 people. Mm. <laughs> and our EPA have 240. So to be in charge of such a big thing, you know, every day to review all these documents, all this paperwork, it's almost like <laughs> impossible. You know, we talk about, we, today we don't have time to touch other issues, but for example, on the dam issue, you know, so, so much is going on in China. Nowadays, you know, we have the largest hydropower capacity in the world, and the plan is to triple that, nearly triple that in 15, 16 years of time. So it's so much going on. All this, you know, 12 large dams have been designed above the Three Gorges Dam. You know, now three are under construction, four are being prepared, and uh, their EIA reports now have been sent to the SEPA. But for, for reveal, but that, that section, that division of SIPA in charge of reviewing all this, along with the road products, along with the forestry, everything, land clearing, all together have three, three people. You know, three people to, to try to safeguard, you know, to try to be the, the goalkeeper. Uh, it's quite, it, it needs allies, it needs support. So because of that, you know, now, but there are hopes, you know, SIPA has made a new law last year. You know, we talked, we didn't mention this law. It's called public participation in EIA process measures. And according to this law, more and more, you know, following this law, more and more EIA, the draft, the shortened version, you know, Elizabeth mentioned about that. The shortened version of the EIA have been opened, you know, have been released, disclosed online more and more, more increasingly. And now it's almost like the board is in our court, you know, half of the court, because we don't have enough NGOs to read. The public, I mean, who, don't, who have time or capacity to reveal all these things? And a group of us who cared about this issue, you know, when we see the first 
disclosure of the EIA report of, uh, of one major dam on the Yangtze River just uh, last month, we wrote a comment. Uh, it's a 7,000 words uh, EIA report they give us. And we wrote 9,000 words in response. You know, basically highlighting a lot of problems. I mean, it's a lot, there are a lot of holes for peer review, you know. It will be helpful. It will be helpful. This will be helpful to, uh, to, to, to SIPA. You know, I think China going to develop for sure. Um, we all believe that and so we, we all support that. But in the meantime, we have to balance development and environmental protection protection, you know, got to be sustainable. Uh, and the best way to do that is to make sure, you know, every single project, you allow the affected communities to be informed, to have the rights to participate. You don't want one interest group to dominate the whole process like now. And, uh, um, and then we could make a balanced, more balanced, more reasonable decision. I think at the end of the day, although we are environmentalists, you know, we we do want to, we, we have our goal, we have our environmental goal, but in the meantime, we, you know, if it gone through a, 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 pra, a, a proper process, we bow to that. Thank you. And let's thank him very much.